Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypto News Podcast. We are buzzing as always, still coming in hot from Mexico. And I'm super pumped to have the one and only Bobby Zagoda back on for round two. He crushed it the first time. It was too good. We had to have him on for round two. And today we have him. Even though you guys know who he is, I'm going to give him one intro just to tickle all of your fancies. We got Bobby Zagoda on the show today. As I said, US CEO and Chief Commercial Officer at Bitstamp. Before Bitstamp, he came from Kraken, where he served as Chief Commercial Officer responsible for strategy, biz dev, marketing, M&A, research, analytics, global growth, a bit of everything. Before that, he was Senior Managing Director of Strategy and Execution and a member of the executive team at the CME Group, a global publicly traded financial exchange. As CEO of the Americas and Global Chief Commercial Officer at Bitstamp, Bobby is responsible for strategy and growing the presence and business globally, as well as overseeing day-to-day ops in the Americas, super tied into everything, regulatory, Bitcoin, ETF, and crypto as a whole. Super pumped to have you back on. Bobby, welcome back to the show, my friend. How you doing? Awesome. Awesome. It's great to be here. And I wish I was in Mexico with you. That would be even better. I know. Before the show, you and I were shooting the shit a little. You are also a big fan of cenotes. How incredible are cenotes? What a treat they are. You know, we we stumbled on them on a trip a few years back where it was on the side of a highway. And I was like, what is this? And we pulled off and it changed my life. It was like getting into another world. And then we became quite focused on them. And we, we hit them all over the area when we were down there by Playa del Carmen. And um, yeah, they're amazing. They're absolutely amazing. It's crazy. They're, they're, like Mexico is one of these places, the more time you spend here, the more just insane you realize it is. Like they have these cenotes everywhere. I And I could be wrong. I don't even know if there's one cenote in USA. I'm pretty darn sure there's none in Canada. We have some beautiful lakes, like obviously Banff with, it, with that sort of turquoise, baby blue glacier, like with the mountains in the background. It's absolutely stunning. One of the few countries you have that. But Mexico has the cenotes. They have all these ruins. They have the Day of the Dead. You have, you know, you have Chichen Itza, which is the pyramid that just like, how the hell was that thing built? No one knows. It's a pretty wild place and uh, it would be pretty sweet. Any any chance uh, Bitstamp throws up a, uh, a Playa del Carmen office? Would you, would you let your boy run that one for you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'll put that on the agenda. Crypto in Mexico. Um, funny note, crypto in Mexico. I was here last year as well. And the amount of places that now accept Bitcoin and Tether is actually pretty wild. It's still not a lot, but when you take a walk down Fifth Ave, you're seeing a hell of a lot more. Um, last weekend, you know, spent some time out with friends, a bunch of Argentinians, and they were telling us as well in Buenos Aires, almost 25%, 33% of places now accept Tether and Bitcoin as well because their wow. currency is so bad. And it's, it's, it's pretty wild to think about. Yeah, no, I think about it a lot. I mean, Latin America it has a different use case, basically. Um, and it's a natural fit because of what you mentioned. You know, the, the economic environment there and, and the level of trust in their institutions is very different than in the U.S. or Canada, right? So, you know, here, I think people look at Bitcoin as recreational or potential investment, et cetera. But... In, in many parts of Latin America, it's it's much more than that. It's a lifeline and it's a, it's a means for very, very hardworking people to preserve their wealth um, versus watch it, you know, watch it tumble in value, you know, based on bad policies or bad institutions or other factors. So, so yeah, I am. Um, I'm not surprised to see that it's becoming a little bit more um, uh, an element of commerce there. Um, and I'm super excited about it. It's an, another wild thing too. We were with uh, you know a group of Argentinians. Eighty percent of them had a crypto app on their phone. Most of them had Binance, but that's literally what they use. You know, like when they get paid here in Mexico, they get paid. They transfer over to Binance, transfer it to another account, and withdraw in the blue dollar, whatever the heck that is in Argentina. I don't even know. There's like a regular, you know, Argentinian peso, then a blue dollar and a regular dollar. I, couldn't really. I, anyways, we were we were sort of into one as well, so we won't dive into that. But just always interesting to think because when I'm in Toronto or you know with family and friends or visiting family and friends in the states, and unless I'm with someone who is orange pilled and is in the crypto sphere, like no one ever messes around on a day to day basis. And we have people here where it's become part of the life. So pretty darn cool to see. But Bobby, you you just jumped into Bitcoin there. I think uh, we we must. It would be a disservice to not jump into this. We had the Bitcoin ETF 
the news was great, but the price action and sentiment is not exactly what we wanted to see. Yeah, I mean, well, firstly, uh, it, it, there's no underestimating what a historic event this is. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying this, but it really is true. This is a level of credibility and validation that has been lacking um, yeah. globally and specifically in the U.S. Uh, so that's, that is super significant. Um, and, and then, of course, the, the access by new segments, segments who have been on the sidelines and waiting for the regulatory cover and kind of the, the, you know, the process that they're familiar with, such as an ETF process. Um, that, that just represents a lot more capital coming into the ecosystem, which, you know, creates momentum and creates opportunities. Um, so, so super positive and, um, and super um, historic. Now, I I didn't expect a um, you know like a a massive spike in in Bitcoin price or or in all of our volumes et cetera as much as I expected you know supported growth over the next few quarters because you know if you are a pension fund um, or a large asset manager who has been waiting for this moment to get involved you know you, it's not like you just flip a switch you know there's work to do there and and uh, to get you know, to get all of the kind of research done and positioning with 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 their customers and and whatnot, and so so I expect that you know the the real benefit here will be felt over a period of time. Um, and same thing on the retail side, like the direct retail side. You know, this is noteworthy for them too, even if they're not um, as likely to buy. Uh, ETF shares as they are to to you know go on an exchange and buy Bitcoin directly, um, and and want to hold it and want to custody the actual um, you know the actual asset. Um, you know I think many of them see this as like all right I've been um, you know maintaining a sliver of investment here, but now it's time to you know to increase and to double yeah. down a bit. Um, yeah. So so yeah, from a Bitstamp perspective, you know we're definitely feeling it in terms of um, being a primary liquidity provider for uh, many of the authorized participants or authorized partners for that for that ecosystem and um, and we're excited about it I think the the price action with Bitcoin right now is just a little bit of a hangover from uh, you know perhaps expectations inflated expectations that it was going to um, to you know be a massive spike in bull rally I've been seeing so many rumors online and again you got to take these with a grain of salt but I'm sure you've heard about this grayscale price action where it's like so many people are getting out of grayscale and for that to happen, they need to sell Bitcoin. Therefore, price of Bitcoin is dropping so then they can get into the ETFs. Is any of this true or is this all just blah, blah, blah? I, you know, I don't know. Um, I've seen those, uh, those, those rumors as well. Um, and I don't, you know, I think any kind of new major, you know, multi-billion dollar, you know, investment tool and or ecosystem is going to have to find its sea level, if you will, because there's a lot of new entrants and there's a lot of, you know, people who have been waiting at this for this moment to get out and other things. So, so I don't put much um, credence into, you know, long-term effects or, or, um, or, you know, market um, flaws, if you will. I just think it's got to find its sea level and, and then start growing. Yeah, well said there. I'd love if you could talk about Bitstamp's relationship with the ETF providers and how you guys are, again, just really providing regulatory light, not just for lack of better words, qualitative help, but quantitative help. You guys are a reputable exchange, obviously, and you're supplying a lot of market data, a lot of surveillance to these ETF providers. They're coming to you for advice. How are you guys working with them? How is this whole relationship, you know, working on on your end of the spectrum? Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's working very very well. And to your point, you know, when when a particular authorized partner is servicing BlackRock or, you know, a very large scale, um, super Huge. reputable. Um, ETF provider or issuer, um, you know, it does raise the stakes for them a little bit to make sure everything's buttoned up and uh, that there's no undue or unnecessary regulatory risk or other things. So, so Bitstamp, um, you know, comes to the fore in those situations typically because we, we have in general the most extensive, uh, you know, licensing footprint and we've got 
you know, a level yeah. of governance um, and, and in our company that's um, not typical in the space, right? So, you know, we're, you've heard me say some of this, but, you know, seven years of, of um, global financial audits by a big four accounting firm, you know, that, that just doesn't exist uh, in the space. And we've got... It doesn't grow on trees. Yeah, <laughs> you know, all kinds of uh, ISO and other designations that we've got super... Um, professional governance, uh, you know, independent boards for all the entities. And it's it's very much a compliance forward company and a compliance forward firm. And in the ETF um, side of the marketplace, that's more important uh, than it is on perhaps just the trading or speculating side. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're um, positioned very well as a liquidity provider for authorized partners to these issuers and um and you know certainly feeling that in a positive way um in terms of volumes and and um opportunities related to it obviously the market is in this kind of um funny moment right now but um but still you know much much better condition in in my estimation than um you know this time last quarter you know when we were in in kind of september october that was you know that was a very very subdued market and this is already a step function better than that yeah it's it's true I, i'd love to just keep us on this subject for a bit more and then we'll get into some other stuff but i i did tell the story on the pod a couple pods ago and I, I just love your two cents on this my buddy was at atlanta airport and flight got delayed had to go to a different terminal blah 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 and in two different terminals he saw an ad i want to say one was from grayscale and one was from or not grayscale one was from uh, Valkyrie and the other may have been from BlackRock or someone else, but these ETFs are already pumping out ads in places with stupendous amount of foot traffic, like Atlanta Airport, which as a Canadian, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it might be the busiest airport in close to the world, if not USA, which is crazy. If you're a consumer or if you're a fund manager or, or even just a financial advisor and you're getting your high net worth clients into these exchange or into these ETFs, is it a simple pick as like a go for whoever has the lowest fee, go for whoever's doing the most social good and giving back 10 ticks to the Bitcoin miners? Like, how do you, one, how do you feel about the ads already being out? I freaking love it personally. And two, if you were to advise, you know, a consumer on which one to choose, what would, what would you do and, and how would you tell them, you know, the right one to pick? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I'm also excited to see the ads and, you know, the, the, these, you know, these guys have had a few years to, uh, to prepare, unfortunately, because the <laughs> yeah. approval took so long, but, um, but yeah, you know, I think, I, I think a lot of people, um, just individual consumers, as well as, um, you know, investment professionals working for companies, you know, you know, when they see ETF there, it is familiar to them as, as, as their own yeah. kind of thumbprint. And so, so, it, you know, they probably been thinking, I really, I really am curious about Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. I really would like to add something to my portfolio that is, um, you know, a little bit less correlated perhaps to, to the stock market. Um, but you know what, I'm not going to take the time to figure out how to custody this and how to do it safely. And, which platform to operate in, you know, I just, it's, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to spend that kind of time. But when they see an ETF opportunity, they're like, okay, now I'm ready. This makes it easy for me. I've already got gold ETFs and I've already, you know, done this. I've been, yeah. this is a well, well-trod path for me. Um, I'm just going to, you know, add, add Bitcoin to it and get my feet wet. So that's, that's kind of the, you know, macro sediment, obviously, um, but within that, there's a lot of different types of players, you know, to your point, some who might like, Hey, that's a cool ad. I'm going to go with Valkyrie. Others who might yeah. be like, you know what? The only thing that's meaningful to me is BlackRock or Fidelity, you know, like guy, you know, guys who are yeah, at such a place. scale and at such a reputation that I feel very safe. So I'm just going to go there. And then I think there's a significant part of, of, of the kind of target segment here, that just wants to learn and wants to do the research. And I would, what I would recommend to answer your question is, is yeah, look at the prospectus. Um, you understand the differences in pricing. I've seen some good articles that lay it all out, all the different um, offerings, yeah. and um, you know, and, and make a decision. I think they're all, you know, if they're approved, which they are, um, that means that they're they're fairly safe and reliable. Um, and so I think you can you can um, have the luxury of choice. But do the homework and and see which one feels right to you. 
Yeah, DYOR, do your own research. One of the one of the best but most underused acronyms in all of crypto and investing. Yep. Um, let's keep buzzing on Bitcoin, the having. Everyone thinks April. It's looking like April if we go on this sort of current trend that we're at. I've had some incredible guests on the podcast over the last three months. And I, I want to say it's almost three years ago, this would have been a hundred percent as in the having is going to be the best thing ever for Bitcoin. Now I'd say it's almost 75, 25, 80, 20, maybe even 66, 33. A lot of folks, people who I trust and people who are much smarter than me and much more switched on in this space are in the, the camp of it's not going to have the biggest impact as it has over the last couple of halvings. What's your take on this? Or is it, is it still going to help? Is this overvalued? Is already priced in? What's going to happen with the halving? And I guess by the time this episode airs, really three months, give or take. I do think it's going to help, but I also agree with what you're saying. It's a little bit different sentiment today than perhaps it felt like a few years ago. And I think that's mostly a function of the space maturing. Um, and people, particularly given you know, the kind of tumultuous ride over the last 18 months, you know, are a little bit um, less ready to hype to hype stuff, um, hype event driven stuff, um, and rather focus on the more fundamental aspects of this now fairly mature uh, marketplace. And so I don't think that's negative or positive, but I think that's, you know, that that's what's playing out here. And that's how I think about it. I cannot fully understand the relationship between the having and the market effect. I can't map it. But um, but I can appreciate history, right? And and the history is quite quite clear and quite compelling um, about the relationship between between the having and and price you know price increase uh, for Bitcoin. I'm um, usually with a with about a six month gap, right? Um, but between those two things, um, so I'm not one to count it out. But I'm also not one to um, ever assume some kind of uh, flipping of the switch, spike, bull run, you know, everything yeah. changes. I, I just think it's going to be another brick in the wall, if you will, of the foundation of a solid and growing marketplace. And um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I think in addition to... Um, you know, the ETF and and more institutional involvement, et cetera, et cetera. It's just going to be a momentum, uh, a momentum creator, um, which is which is good. Yeah, it's exactly what we need. Last time we spoke, you did call this um, and you did say that the Bitcoin ETF did need to happen. And if it did, it you know, it would have positive impact on the market. And from a sentiment perspective, I believe it has obviously the price has fallen. Do we know if it's exactly from that? Could it be grayscale? Could it be something else? None of us will ever know. What else needs to happen, Bobby, from a perhaps regulatory standpoint? Is you're one of the few people who actually have, you know, the wherewithal and the experience and the the switched onness to comment on this. Are there any other regulatory steps or building blocks that need to happen, short term, long term, for this momentum to really keep building? Any events? perhaps the election in November. Is there anything else that could really, really help us that you know it might be coming up in the next three, six, nine, 12 months? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll start in the negative, right? So the uncertainty, this is my, my feeling, the uncertainty re related to regulation in the US and the macro political environment in the US because the election is yeah. coming up. That uncertainty is really, I think, uh, an anchor or a, uh, a bit of a, a drag on progress and momentum in the marketplace today. So, you know, my hope is that there can be some positive um, movement on regulation in the US this year. Now, that's a tall order given it's an election year and everything. And I certainly wouldn't say, yeah, I certainly wouldn't say it's a given, but, but, you know, I'm wondering if, if uh, Congress can, can, you know, act on stable coins, for instance, you know, one, one piece of the puzzle that is, um, you know, super relevant right now. And, um, and in my yeah. estimation, you know, easier to operate on from a legal framework uh, perspective, that would really help. That would really be another momentum um, booster. And then, you know, the election is going to happen one way or another uh, in November. And, uh, you know, uh, will, will that be favorable to the market or not? We don't know, but what we do know or what we believe is that 
clarity, more certainty is going to help, you know, one way, yeah. one way or another. You know, we're seeing this in Europe already. So in Europe, you know, in, 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 on just the regulatory front, they're a little bit ahead in my estimation, right? Because the European Union has adopted the MICA framework, which will come into, uh, come into play yeah. at the end of the year. And, um, and that certainty or that clarity is allowing more institutions in particular, but but more individuals as well get involved with a level of comfort and a level of confidence. And it's starting to shape the conversations there in a way that's not it's not happening here yet. Um, and you know the how, how we're feeling that mostly is is for instance we have this white label offering but stamp as a service. I think I mentioned to you last time. But it's you know it's focused on institutions, banks and fintechs and um, you know, those companies are quite, um, you know, we're engaged with many of them right now who want to be able to offer crypto services to their customers for all the obvious reasons. Like they don't want their customers leaving their ecosystem or their app to buy some Bitcoin. Of course. They'd rather keep them yeah. in their ecosystem and offer that service, but they're not going to build it at this stage. So they turn to you know, a very regulated, you know, long track record, um, you know, uh, very reliable technology kind of company like this stamp to help to help provide that. Um, in the U.S., you know, banking and crypto are, you know, not not simpatico today. Um, and there's yeah. a lot of frictions um, that have been put in place. And and so we're it's just at a very, very different spot. So to answer your question, you know, if if we could get a little bit more regulatory clarity in the U.S., that's that's the missing link, if you will, for me to really get the entire global marketplace to to a next level. Yeah, it's true. What's that famous quote? If you if you don't know the rules, you can't play the game. Something like exactly. that. Exactly. Again, if there's if there's no rules, the big boys can't get in. Um, you guys white labeling. That's I, I know we did discuss this a little bit last time, but I'd love to jump back into this. What exactly are you just really giving them exactly what they're looking for? And, and I understand that this you know doesn't happen that much in the U.S. It's more Bitstamp global, uh, as you just discussed, because of the regulatory shit show in the states. But is this just financial institute or institution X, Y, or Z coming in and saying we want to keep you know we want to keep our people in our ecosystem and we need solution A, B, C, and you guys go look. We are you know, we're KYC and regulatory up to yin yang and we're going to give you what you want. You give it to them, they slap their label on it and boom, it's just a good product, good relationship. Is that how it works for lack of better understanding? Yeah, I mean, in essence or at its core, it's exactly that. Um, but there's a couple of nuances. First of all, we have different levels of offerings. Some are like, you know, full white label turnkey solution that uh, a bank can just yeah. adopt. Others are kind of gradations of it. But, um, but, What's notable is, you know, this, these are some of the largest global banks in the world based in Europe that we're in yep. deep conversations with about this. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's very noteworthy when you think about the overall crypto ecosystem. And, and these banks, of course, I can't speak for them, but based on the work that we are <laughs> proposing to do with them, you know, it's, it's exactly that. They want to be able to enable their millions of customers to just simply buy and sell, you know, it's nothing um, exotic, but buy and sell, you know, the majors, the major cryptocurrencies in, in a simple, safe, reliable way. And so, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're kind of in Europe in particular, which is our home base and our, you know, kind of strongest marketplace, we're a, we're a pretty obvious choice for that. Um, and we're excited. And there's other related, um, you know, flavors of this, including with payments, providers you know we're in conversations with a couple of the world's largest payment providers because they want to make it easier for their millions of clients to utilize crypto uh, in their payments processes and so so you know these if you just take those two you know possibilities uh you know that that could really um in europe take the entire ecosystem you know to to a next level uh so so i'm anxious to you know for the rest of the world and, and specifically the U.S. to get caught up. Well said there. 
But we got to take a quick break, give a huge shout out to our sponsor of the show. When we get back, we are going to keep diving into everything Bitstamp related. Until then, huge shout out to our sponsor of the show, that is Prime XBT, longtime friends of CryptoNews.com and longtime sponsors of the Crypto News Podcast. Prime XBT offers a robust trading system for both beginners and professional traders. It doesn't matter if you're a rookie or a vet, you can easily design and customize your layouts and widgets to best fit your trading style. Prime XBT is also running an exclusive promotion for listeners of the Crypto News Podcast. Use the promo code CryptoNews50 to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. Again, that is Crypto News 50 to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. And jumping back in. I was going to ask you about consensus, but I saw you take a big swig of what I assume is water out of that <laughs> super nice looking bottle. Are, are you are you on the Stanley wave? Are you on the Stanley wave that's absolutely blown up everywhere? Have you heard about this nonsense? I, I, don't, I don't think I have, but it is water. Is that what it's about? I, I mean, th- this is like, this is pretty, you know, it's TikTok-y, Instagram-y, trendiness, Stanley, the cup company, the tumbler, uh, you know, yeah. keep Thermos. your drink cold or warm. They're blue. Thermos, yeah, they're absolutely blowing up for no good reason. Just it's one of those things where it's just like in today's day and age, you get lucky for going viral. I I had to ask if you had one. I don't have one. I'm seeing people down here, mostly American and Canadian tourists, you know, showing off multiple Stanley mugs. It's like it's like wearing a Rolex now (laughs) to show up. It's crazy. Some some lady in California stole like 60 of them and was gonna resell them on like just nonsense. Little off little off topic, but um, I guess w- one more thing on that note is you and I are hockey fans. The Stanley Cup for the first time in like, you know, since SEO was invented in, I don't know, the late 90s, got outranked. So when you search Stanley Cup, it is no longer Lord Stanley, oh. the, you know, the hardest trophy to win in all of sports yeah. for hockey, the National Hockey League. Oh. Now you have some crummy tumbler. Just, that is just, what is our world succumbing to? That, that is wrong <laughs> on so many levels. I don't even know where to start. Brutal. So let's jump back in. Uh, as, as my duty, I always have to lurk my guest Twitter. And a couple of days ago, you fired off a tweet that you are excited to share that you are proposing a panel, DeFi for Capital Markets at Consensus. This seems super cool. You guys are obviously in the DeFi space as well, and especially in capital markets. That's where we can really, really move the needle, not just retail. I feel like most of DeFi is retail at the moment. Part of that is because, again, the complexities, the nuances, the account abstraction, it's such a nightmare. It is truly, truly just horrendously difficult to use. I'll never forget the first time I dabbled with MetaMask or tried bridging coins or did anything of the like. It was nightmare fuel in the purest sense. What exactly is this DeFi for Capital Markets panel that you are proposing at Consensus 2024? Yeah, it's really uh, it's really interesting and I couldn't agree more. It's kind of like, I think the right topic for this time, for 2024. Um, there's so many dimensions to the DeFi opportunity and ecosystem, but... The thing that is a still a common denominator is it's just a little bit too hard for um, institutions and individuals to participate, and it's associated with uh, risk. Also, I think it's a different, a little bit different kind of risk profile than operating with a centralized exchange or other other platform, and that requires more education. So the real question here is, you know, when does that really quite incredibly innovative space, the DeFi space, become more um, legit and integrated with the rest of the traditional financial services capital markets space. And I don't think that's going to happen tomorrow, but I think it's something that we need to be thinking about and talking about. So so some very, very smart people put together this this concept and this panel and and um, were nice enough to include me in it. and and uh, but, yeah, super excited. Um, but I guess we have to be chosen, right? It has to be somebody people have to go out and vote for uh, vote for this panel. So I, I encourage your audience to do that. On the subject of 2024 trends, speaking of trends, are there any other trends, micro, macro? We'll stay away from any of the price prediction nonsense, but are there any other trends that are really getting you going? Again, we're not even a month into the year. A lot of people, myself included, are bullish for a lack of better terms on this year. You know, we have a lot of things that went in the right direction. Of course, the ETF just popped off. It should be good. Um, the Fed also sort of said that, you know, there, there will be some rate cuts this year and that usually goes hand in hand with good things for the economy. What 
trends do you see for 2024 that could take us in the right direction? D- definitely agree with those those couple. Um, and then what I would add to that is, you know, there's there's what we're seeing at Bitstamp is um, you know really strong onboarding for institutions and for retail um, retail investors, and that's always a leading indicator of confidence in in the marketplace. So even during the last half of 2023 we saw a lot of um, increases in onboarding, even though the marketplace was tough, the volatility was was quite low. And to me, that's like, okay, people are getting ready, particularly institutions, you know, they, there's some lead time there once they, uh, once they get onboarded, integrated, et cetera. Um, and so far in yeah, 2024, that's in, it's accelerated. Uh, so, and you know, November, December, January have been really, good volatility months, which is a big part of it. But, um, but also I think the, this wave of adoption that I believe we are embarking on here in 2024 is a little bit different investor, whether it's an institution or an individual, it's a little bit different mindset. They're not the pioneers, right? They're not the super comfortable with risk perspectives. They're arguably the fast followers or the followers, right? Once the, once the path has been paved over a bit, now they're getting involved. And what they care about is a little bit different than what the first couple of waves cared about, right? They're, they're not all about whiz bang, you know, Silicon Valley tech kind of mindset. They're, they're about like, is it safe? Who's the right partner? You know, yeah. what I, I'm going to, I'm not afraid to do my homework, you know, kind of, it's a different audience. And I think a little bit more conservative in many, in many respects. And so um, that's where, you know, companies like Bitstamp are positioned quite well because it's, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a flight to quality, you know, still happening given, given the, the Binance situation. And, and of course the, you know, the FTX and the other situations prior to that. So this next, the other trend is this next wave of adoption is going to be different. More hedge funds, more asset managers, more traditional financial services companies, not just hardcore traders. And, um, and I think uh, probably a little bit different demographic of, um, of individuals involved, which is great. The other trend I would mention is, is uh, more generational, right? So, so I've been reading a lot lately about, about wealth transfer. And, um, you know, we are in the midst of the largest wealth transfer generationally from one generation to another in the history of the world, right? So, and it's something like 10 trillion, you know, dollars of value or something that's going to move, that's insane. you know, from essentially the baby boom generation to, um, you know, younger generations that are, you know, either crypto native or super mobile uh, adaptive and people who can naturally relate to the idea of digital money versus um, where all the money's sitting right now with the older generations where it's not as natural for them to relate to digital money and all the possibilities associated with it. So that's another thing. That's not going to just play out in 2024. It's going to play out over the next several years, but it's, it's real and it's big. That's, I always forget about this wealth transfer thing. It's crazy. Like it, it really is. And, and I guess that's my, would it be my generation as someone who's born in 95 who is like we're the ones getting all this money now, right? Yeah. It's coming from our parents and my parents, parents, my grandparents. I mean, one left, but you know, it it, it, it is my generation, the millennials, who are about to to get all this cake, right? Exactly, and 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 Gen Z also, uh, but millenn- millennials primarily, and and it's um, I think part of it is also the baby boom generation has lived longer than than you know, yeah. past generations because of all the advances in healthcare and, 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 and fitness, et cetera, et cetera. So they've held on to it longer too. So it's, it's more pent up. Um, you know, I mean, like we've got, you know, an election coming up, we might have two 80 year old guys that we're, you know, having to choose between in the U S like, how does that happen? Crazy. Um, you know, Crazy. The, this, this generation really clings to, clings to stuff. <laughs> and, um, I, I sometimes like to see them retire, uh, and, and take a well-deserved break on a beach somewhere, maybe in Playa del Carmen. That'd be great. Well, I, I mean, I know this isn't a political podcast, but you know, we got a drama teacher running our country, so it's uh, <laughs> is he, he, he can't win them all. Can't that's win that's all. A, a little off topic, but that that's something I often think about too. Where it's like the incentives of being at the top of the political food chain 
I feel like with social media and everything else, the cons almost outweigh the pros nowadays. And again, obviously, in for the states, for you guys, it's most powerful, uh, arguably best country in the world, um, most freedom. You guys, once you're president of the United States, you are truly a geopolitical figure. You're one of the most powerful people in the world until the day you die, and then your family gets to bear those fruits as well. But it's like, why aren't more quality people wanting to do this? Like. And, and use this social good. I, I feel like it's, you know, it's changed and, and it's like, oh, I'd rather be an influencer or be a, a TikToker or be rich. You know, it's like we need more people to get into to get into high level politics and and actually move the needle. And, and I know in Canada we have, I, I'm not as, I don't follow the states obviously as, as much as I follow my own country, but we literally have zero people in the pipeline, Bobby. And, and to my knowledge in the states, you guys don't have a whole lot of people either. And it's it's something that sort of baffles my mind. Why wouldn't you want to be the most powerful person in the world? It seems like a pretty freaking cool game, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, I you know I think about this a lot, and um, I think it's true what you're saying. I think the for many for many potential great leaders, you know, and people who perhaps have a passion for that kind of social um, role and and leadership opportunity, I think they get, um, you know, first of all, great opportunities in the business world, you know, and, and yeah. arguably the business world is another great leadership opportunity. You know, it's 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 a Agreed. capital L. If you can progress, um, it's a it's a really worthy and and noble leadership opportunity, but very different than government. But it doesn't come with all the cons of government, like you alluded to. You know, it, it's uh, it's um, not. I'm sure I haven't done it, of course. But you know, it, any kind of political role, um, you know, is not for the faint of heart, right? You get criticized, uh, you know, ten times a minute, and your family it's gets crazy. scrutinized, and you know, your privacy yeah. is gone, and and um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of costs. You got to really, you got to really want it and really believe. But but because of this, I do fear. That we don't have the pipeline either. Um, you know, it's a little bit more complicated in this. I don't know the Canadian frame of reference well, but in the States, it's quite complicated, you know, because I think they, there's a lot of, you know, backroom deal making where, you know, yes. um, where perhaps the talent uh, can't, can't break in. The talent, you know, maybe has a hard yeah. time breaking in. It's a little bit too old school networks, uh, et cetera, but I don't know. Yeah. No, just building on your point about about business. It's like if, if you can be a powerful businessman or woman and, you know, take a company public, make a couple billion dollars. Once you have a couple billion, like there's not much you can't do in this world. You want to buy an island? You want to spend 500, you know, mil on a yacht? Go for it. Like what, what can you not do, yeah. right? Want to just fly private on multiple jets? Want to own a sports team? You can do whatever the hell you want without all the public scrutiny. So it's like... It, it comes down to anything else in life. Life's all about incentives. And and I feel like we need to better incentivize, you know, the the most powerful position in the world. But, you know, this isn't the uh the New York Times political podcast. So we'll 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 jump <laughs> we'll back to that. that. We'll jump back to the crypto stuff. Bitstamp, you guys are shipping. You guys are always shipping. You guys are the king of shippers, just pumping out products at a crazy rate. We'd love to see that. What else do you guys have on the docket? I know you probably can't tell me most of it, but of the things you can tell me, give me some gold here, Bobby. What are you guys up to over the next couple months in, uh, in 2024 for Bitstamp? Sure, sure. Well, we, you know, we're very excited. I'll, I'll talk about retail and I'll talk about institutions. Um, yeah, on the retail side, you know, we've in 2023, we, we launched a new app a new app experience that really is targeted at the types of users we, we were talking about earlier, this next wave of adoption. Um, so, you know, it's a simple buy sell experience, but it's connected to our learn center so that people, you know, it's a place people can go get educated in a very kind of bite sized and objective way and then do simple transactions. Um, and it's in contrast to our pro app, which is, you know, advanced order types and it's really geared more towards traders and people who are very acquainted with the marketplace. So that's been great. Um, we also have a lending um, offering available, not in the US, um, not in the UK, but in Europe um, and in Asia. It's an opportunity for users to um, lend their uh, crypto into um, a marketplace that you know is, is very, very highly organized and regulated and transparent. 
so that they can earn a return or a yield on that um, on that crypto. And you know, this space uh, a couple of years ago in 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 the crypto. Um, ecosystem was a was was a disaster, and you know, but it's it's a place where Bitstamp can bring the Bitstamp version of it, you know, which is regulated, transparent, um, and and super reliable, and so that has grown quite a bit um, for us in in its in, since its inception at the middle of last year. So we we are very excited about those two opportunities. Um, fueling uh, growth in 2024. We also think there's some really interesting token projects out there. Um, you know that, um, and we're quite discerning about what we what we list on Bitstamp. But we think there's some really interesting token projects out there that we're that we're evaluating. Um, on the in, on the institutional side, um, you know we we will have a fairly major announcement coming um, coming soon. Uh, but you know, suffice it to say, you know, we want to give our institutional um, participants, you know, more more ways to um, to participate in crypto markets and and, and participate with Bitstamp in our kind of safe, reliable way in crypto markets. So that's a primary focus with us. I wish I could tell you more, but um, but coming soon. Um, and then we've also launched an OTC uh, uh, offering um, in 2023 that we're growing now. Uh, you know, so there's an RFQ platform and also kind of a facilitation desk. So this is, you know, we, we just get a lot of requests from, uh, from our client base and people who, um, crypto whales or others who want to, you know, move size. Um, and they, you know, they're smart enough about markets to know that that needs to be done in an orderly way and we can make that turnkey for them. So, um, so those are things, a few things we're excited about. Love that. Bobby, always appreciate you coming on, man. We uh, we have a blast together, and you always uh, you always make my head spin in the best of ways possible. Always leaving me with some homework to do, uh, and I'm sure our listeners feel the same way. Appreciate you as always. Uh, before you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you and Bitstamp online and on socials? Yeah, we uh, we're uh, very very active on um, X and on LinkedIn from a social media standpoint, um, as am I, and uh, that's our primary focus from a social media standpoint. And folks, as always, I will uh, I will plug everything. And Bobby coming in hot with the X. Wow, I always ask Twitter. <laughs> I, I I still call it Twitter. In I'm my trying. Mind's Twitter. I don't call it X in or whatever. It's it's all. It's always Twitter for me. It's always Twitter. The domain is nice. The x.com domain is nice, but it's always Twitter. Bobby, thank you as always. Can't wait for round three. And uh, at your guys' current clip, I'm sure that'll be sooner rather than later. But thanks again, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Matt. It's been great. Folks, what an episode with Bobby Zagoda. Always bringing the heat. We love having Bobby on as he gives us some gold every single time. We discussed everything Bitstamp related, Bitcoin ETF to having DeFi for Capital Markets 2024 predictions institutions, you name it. Huge shout out to Bobby and the team for making this happen. Listeners, if you guys enjoyed this one, and I hope you did, please do subscribe. It would mean the world to my team and I. Speaking of the team, love you guys so much. Thank you for everything. You stas, my amazing sound editor. You're the goat. And back to the listeners, love you guys. Keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon.